Light Roast is overrated. Is this rage bait? Are you trying to get me to watch just so I can get mad? Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe just a little. No, but in reality, today's video is about roast color. How we can use it in order to understand our own preferences. Somebody might enjoy their blonde roast at Starbucks and they fancy themselves a light roast drinker because in that environment, that is light. So then they go to a specialty shop with a friend saying, oh, you like light stuff, let's go here. You taste the coffee there, awful, putrid, you hate it. The corollary is true. You're really into specialty coffee. You like super lightly roasted stuff, Nordic style, really light, wheatgrass, some might call it. And you have a friend who knows you're into coffee. They're wanting to be nice. They're like, oh, they like light roast. So they go to a supermarket and they pick you up a bag of light roast, whatever. You get it and it's terrible. You can't, you can't stomach it. It's, it's vitriol, it's vile. Obviously, this is a broken nomenclature. So when we're looking at coffees to buy, light, medium, dark, it's not helpful. But behind that, the reason that these have kind of stuck around and why we're still trying to rename them is because outside of it all, it is helpful. So we understand that roast color is an important thing, an indicator of whether or not we will like something. There is something to color that is actually pretty massive we need to understand. Now I know a few of you might have a knee-jerk reaction to that and say, no, that's not true. The roast variations are much more important. They're more nuanced. Well, you might be thinking of coffee only as a very specific range of color. You might only be thinking of ultra lightly roasted coffees. And therefore, yeah, maybe color is not the biggest thing there because you can get the same color with two different roast profiles. In that case, if you have two coffees of the same exact color, then yeah, the roast profile is what matters most, so of course. But when we're talking about a wide range, when we look at coffee as a massive spectrum where people can lie on either side, then yes, color is the biggest predictor. Oh, nice. Okay, okay, perfect. One of the papers I'm going to kind of focus on is one by Morton Munchow back in 2020. He had years of data that spanned back at least four years where he was doing 18,500 data points with multiple different trained sensory panels, including one that was at the Nordic Roaster Forum that Tim Wendelbo helped put on. But anyway, in this study, he shows that color is the biggest predictor of sensory variation. Not roast time, not roast temperature, not any of these other things, but color. They did have coffees ranging from really dark, I and mean, they tried to make it like a commodity specialty coffee kind of mix at the lower end, and then to the Nordic at the very top. Before we kind of get a little bit further, let's first talk about roast color and how this is measured. I've had this for a while now. It's the Dye Fluid Omni. Uh, this was sent to me. This is not a review of it. This is only me saying this was the impetus for this video. This measures both particle size analysis, so it's like a particle size distribution machine. I don't think it does that great of a job with that, only because they don't release the full data. The charts they give you on here are very misleading. They're not as accurate. But anyway, that's a little side tangent. It also reads color. So what it does is inside it has lights, it has cameras, and it's doing imaging, and it gives you a number when you put ground coffee under it or whole beans. This number correlates to a kind of scale. They say it's to mirror Agtron. Of course, it's not identical to Agtron, but so be it. That's it. Yep. What is Agtron? It's essentially just the number one way that people have been reading the color of coffee for a long time, and it's kind of the industry standard. There are other ways of doing it, other cheaper methods, and they're all valid as long as they're consistent and you calibrate it and you use the same equipment every time. These numbers span from low to high. The lower is darker coffee, so a darker color, a darker hue. A higher number is lighter around 50 to 75 could be considered like dark roast. That 75 to maybe 100 would be that kind of like medium or so range. I would imagine that maybe Starbucks Blonde would lay in here, but this is that medium kind of area. Maybe close to 100 is getting to, to the light-ish area with the way that I'm measuring, by the way. Once you get over 100 to maybe 120, you're in the light area. Like, pretty light. Say, for instance, reads about 115 to 118 on my reading. Tim Wendelbow is around that same area, Coffee Collective. And then when you get over 120, you're in the super light regime. You're in the very light, the lightest of the light. Even over 140 can be had, and it's incredibly light. Agtron for forever has been advocating a coarser grind size in order to read the color, up to around 800 microns, I believe it is. That's pretty dang coarse. That's like a pour over course. 
I have actually found, and, and so is ProBot, the roasting company, and the people I've talked to, like Dr. Marc Chamery and, and Dr. Samuel Smirke, uh, agree that it's probably better to go as fine as possible, because then you can make more of a matte appearance. There's not as much scattering going on. So you get a higher number, which is a lighter reading, but it would be more consistent. And since these numbers are to be relative anyway, I think that's more helpful. It reads whole bean, and you can do that, but whole bean, it seems that there's variation from roaster to roaster, whether it's conductive or convective, on how much kind of darkness it's putting on the outer part. It's when you grind it up, you tend to get a much better understanding of the color that's actually uh, more effective or more uh, efficacious on the taste. A quick tangent just for you to understand roasting just a smidgen. Usually they're a drum roaster, but they can be an air roaster, something along those lines, fluid bed roaster, etc. So you put room temperature green coffee beans inside the machine, heats it up, heats it up, heats it up. The water inside is expanding until eventually it cracks. And then you have what's called first crack. And then after first crack until the end of the roast is what is referred to as development time. And that was made up by Scott Rayo some years ago, but it's kind of this idea that that's where you're actually developing the coffee. The aroma formation is most rapid during this time, and so it's kind of the most important part to really pay attention to. And, and that this is actually reflected in the study by Morton Munchau. He found that the time to first crack had a lot less to do with anything sensory than that development time. About 80% of the indication of the sensory result was coming from color. The other 20 was from time. It's more so the proportion between the two that is really going to tell you the story of that coffee's taste. Now I would argue that weight loss is another very important aspect. Again, they were doing a wide spectrum. When you get into smaller spectrums, maybe you're only looking at coffees that score on, on my reading a 110 to 130, then of course other things come into play that are bigger. So you could have a really lightly roasted coffee that reached first crack really quickly and they had it at a lower temperature during that development time and extended it a long time. You could have a light color, but it could taste baked. You can have different profiles reach the same color. And during the day as the roaster's heating up, people may be getting the same drop temperature, but you could have slightly different development time ratios or the converse is true. Maybe you're aiming for a development time ratio and you hit with a different drop temperature and that can affect the color, which greatly does affect the taste. There is a a lot of variation in these different areas on the spectrum where you can not enjoy a coffee. So just because a coffee is a color you like doesn't mean you'll enjoy the coffee. But the point is, if you get a coffee at that color, the likelihood of you liking it more than something 20 or 30 points lower than that is a very high likelihood. You might have a great roasted coffee that's sitting at a 90, but if you normally like 120, you may prefer a baked 120 coffee. And in fact, it seems that the data points that way. Let's say in a perfect world, every roaster was posting their numbers and you understood the numbers, they were calibrated well and they all kind of made sense. You could get something in your perfect range, but it could taste terrible. Maybe it's an origin you love, maybe it's a farm you love, maybe it's a process you love, but it may not taste very good. Tim wasn't really the first to do a Nordic style. There was this term that kind of surfaced called Nordic style roast, and this was going lighter than the typical light roast. So already people saw that the terminology was broken, the nomenclature was broken back then, added another level because there was lighter than light that was being done. But what's interesting is this was roasted about 50 or 60 years ago. I did a video about two years ago tasting it. A Patreon uh, member of mine sent me this, and he said, do you want this? Do you want to try this in a video? I read it because I was curious. It sits at 110. That is essentially Nordic style, and that was 50, 60 years ago. In different areas around the world, people culturally just prefer different roast levels, and that's absolutely okay. But I thought that was really funny, just how light this coffee was, even 50 or 60 years ago. Something unheard of elsewhere in the world. You had super dark coffees going throughout Southern Europe and in the US when coffee emerged, and all over the world. Let's say that you have a roaster you really enjoy and they offer right. espresso and a filter roast. And you go, well, I'm drinking espresso, so I guess I should get the espresso roast. If they posted the numbers and you see how much darker it is, or you, or you might see what number kind of zone it's in, and it doesn't match what you, with what you typically enjoy on espresso, you know, maybe you should get the filter roast instead. Because with filter to espresso, there's actually a pretty big difference in that roast degree. The inspiration came from me taking this one day and just reading all of the coffees in my studio, all 70 or 80 coffees that I had in here, and I just documented them on a Google Sheet. I made it public, it'll be down below as well, so you can kind of look at that uh, to, to see if any of your favorite roasters are on there. And in fact, I have a few roasters on that Excel sheet down below that show some of these differences in filter to espresso.
Some can be as high as 15 to 20 different unit points on that scale, which is a huge difference. And it may be bringing out something you don't like. In our everyday lives, when we taste coffees, we know that the darker coffee goes, especially for our own palate, the darker the color, the more bitter, the less fruity, the less acidic, the less sweet. Though that doesn't mean bad, because there are people whose palates are attuned to that. It is bad for people who don't like those things. And the lighter it goes, the corollary can be true to an extent. You can get so light that it's kind of underdeveloped and you get kind of a grassy taste. There are these kind of regions where we can understand what we like. And so the only way to really find things that we're liking is to understand at the outset where it's sitting in that color range. When I was doing these readings and I was seeing, you know, exactly where they were sitting with an objective number, it actually was matching some of my anecdotal experience of me going, oh, so-and-so is lighter than so-and-so. I was looking at it going, oh, that was actually true. And it was also helpful and edifying whenever I was noticing that something might be too light. I was like, oh, that's true as well. When I, for instance, measured the Intelligentsia Pink Bourbon, normally Intelligentsia Coffee reads a bit darker, but that one read at around that 120 mark, which is super light. And in my video right here of dialing in different pour overs, I even remarked in it, and it was, it was better for me. It sat more in my kind of preference area. In that study, they only used washed coffees. Now, why is this important? It's important because the green themselves can be greatly affected by the processing. So for instance, I have out a coffee from my friend Ben Morrow at Manhattan. This is an anti-maceration coffee. They actually roasted it very lightly in the sense that it has very low weight loss, which means it wasn't in the roaster that long, and it did not drop at a very high temperature. But this reads at a very dark number. At about a 10 to 11% weight loss, this was reading at like a 95. And Ben was telling me that when this green arrived, it actually wasn't green. It was already pretty brown. That's a similar thing for decaf coffees and why those look so much darker. When you get those due to the processing, they look almost brown. So already the color is darker. So these are obviously aberrations to the norm, which is, uh, you know, like washed coffees or natural coffees, honey coffees, something that, yes, the, the natural and the honey can be a bit darker, but in reality, when you're done roasting, that ground profile is gonna be very similar to something of washed. But there are some processes that are gonna cause it to be even darker. Why do I think this is important? Well, one, I wanted this to be a call out to roasters to actually invest in these color readers and to provide the colors to their patrons. I think for quality control and is something that everyone should have implemented at their roastery. So if you are a roaster, you should have some sort of color reader and have a very specific quality control regimen in place in order to make sure that your batches are consistent. For consumers at home, if we had access to this, I do think that we would be able to find coffees we enjoy a lot more, a lot more easily, as opposed to having to rely on forums, people around the world tasting coffees and reporting, and then trying to see if you're calibrated to that person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It may seem like a lot, but in the end, it's trying to simplify your purchasing. There's so many options now with all these specialty roasters and roasters popping up everywhere that if you had a good way of understanding what it's like, it may help. Very nerdy video. I hope that you enjoyed it. Hope it wasn't too much rambling, but it was something I thought was interesting. And um, that's about it for me today. Thank you so much for watching and hope you brew something tasty.